But I have learned with this uh, this form of cancer, Chris, uh, to go on living your life. Uh, don't sit on the sideline. Uh, don't surrender. Uh, do everything that you would be doing normally, even if you have to do it a little bit differently or a little slower. Uh, but keep doing it. It's our limiting beliefs that ultimately keep us from becoming the best we're capable of becoming. Something's got to change, but that change has to happen first on the inside. It's time to get unstuck. It's time to get your why back. It's never too late. Let's start today. Helping you design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. This is Win Today. And now, here's your host, Christopher Cook. Hey, my friends. Welcome to episode 134 of Win Today. This is your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. Thanks for being here, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in each and every week. Thanks for the download. Well, listen, today's conversation is all about one word, character. In 2019, looking at culture and the chaotic way so many people interact in relationships, on the news, through social media, and in politics, especially politics, I believe we're in a society that is in a huge deficit of character. So today, we're talking about 12 specific qualities of character that you and I should ensure that we employ every single day especially when no one else is watching. Isn't that the epitome of character? Doing the right things when no one else is watching. So check this out. Overlooking the Hudson River on the campus of the United States Military Academy at West Point are 12 granite benches, each inscribed with a word representing a key leadership virtue. Compassion, courage, dedication, determination, dignity, discipline, integrity, loyalty, perseverance, responsibility, service, and trust. These benches remind cadets of the qualities that lead to victory and success, not just on the battlefield, but in all of life. So joining us today to talk about these 12 virtues for life is NBA legend and co-founder and senior vice president of the Orlando Magic, Pat Williams. Pat Williams has been a lifelong student of life and leadership. As a young man, he learned that who you are on the inside is vastly more important than what you do on the outside. As co-founder and senior vice president of the Orlando Magic, Pat, a basketball hall of famer, was responsible for drafting Shaquille O'Neal and Anthony Penny Hardaway and led the Philadelphia 76ers to a world championship in 1983. But life hasn't always been on the up for Pat. In February of 2011, Pat was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, an incurable form of cancer. Miraculously though, after several rounds of chemotherapy and treatment, Pat's doctors told him that they are unable to detect any myeloma in his body and have given him a clean bill of health. Pat's love for his family is demonstrated with his wife Ruth as they are the parents of 19 children including 14 adopted from four nations. With his signature enthusiasm and insight, today, Pat Williams is going to share the incredible stories of West Point graduates who exemplified 12 essential qualities of leadership character, from the Civil War to the War on Terror. In today's conversation, Pat's going to teach all of us how to develop these 12 essential virtues in our lives, whether we're in the corporate world, in the academic world, the military, the church, or any sphere of life. Right now, let's get to my conversation with the one, with the only, Pat Williams. Well, Pat, welcome to the conversation. This is a tremendous honor. Well, thank you, Chris. Good to chat with you. Look forward to our talk. Oh, Likewise, Pat. This is a really timely conversation because I believe we live in a culture that is in a deficit of character. I'd like to start with your passion for character. Today, you're the senior vice president of the Orlando Magic. You were part of their founding as an organization. But take us back. Where did this passion for leadership and character begin with you? Well, I, I became a leader as a young age in sports in high school. I was a quarterback in football, and I was a catcher in baseball, point guard in basketball. Those are leadership positions. Uh, I then went on and uh, caught at Wake Forest for four years and got into uh, the front office end of baseball. Uh, when I was 23 and then 24 years old, I was thrust into these leadership positions. Mm. 
and so I realized very early on uh, that to be a leader, uh, a successful leader, uh, you've got to be a person of character. Mm-hmm. And that I mean honesty, integrity, and responsibility, and a work ethic, perseverance, yes. uh, ha- having maturity. I was uh, thrust into these areas, and I realized that without character, uh, I was going to fall by the wayside pretty quickly. And mm. so I think as a young man, uh, it all became quite clear to me. And as the years have gone on, it's become even more significant, I think. That's wonderful. And a lot of the leadership and character principles we're going to talk about today were birthed at West Point. And most of us walk through life searching to do the right thing, I believe for the right reasons. But I'd love to ask, Pat, what stood out to you at West Point that brought these qualities to the surface, the qualities we're going to speak about today? Well, several years ago, I was invited to go to West Point and speak to the sports teams and the coaches there. And I did. I had a marvelous experience. And afterwards, they gave me a tour of the West Point campus, which is very moving, by the way, very powerful. We ended up at a little park called Trophy Point that looks out over the historic Hudson River. And as I was going through that little park, I noticed a bench, a a, a concrete bench. And then I looked further and I noticed another one. Eventually, I counted 12 benches. And as I got closer to those benches, I noticed at the end of each bench, there was a word called stone, a a, a different word like compassion. And then you'd see the word courage. You'd see words like integrity and service, responsibility, those kind of words. There was a different word on each bench. And uh, I I thought, boy, this is interesting. There's got to be a story behind this. Uh, And I found out that the class, West Point class of 1935, had donated those benches and selected those words to be carved into the stone because they wanted cadets on the campus to live by those words, to have those words burned into their souls. That was the the story behind this. My next thought was, I don't think anybody knows about this. Uh, This may be one of the better kept secrets in American history. Mm. So I talked to our publisher. I said, I, I can see the book now, a chapter on each one of those words, and then let's find a West Point graduate who who best models or exemplifies that particular word. So that's how the book is made up. Uh, We had a very interesting time seeking out uh, the right West Point graduate to go with each word. That was interesting. But I think we found the right people to go with each chapter and... uh, And so people are going to read the book, they're going to learn about that particular word of character, and then they're going to uh, have an opportunity to read about these men and women uh, who brought that word to life. Indeed, indeed. And Pat, I got to say before we dive in, I finished the book um, Sunday night. It is extraordinary. It's one of the best leadership books I think I've ever read. So thank you for writing it. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate those kind words. We're, We're getting some early feedback that's very positive. Oh, and yeah. uh, we're, we're, we're greatly encouraged by that. So good. Well, Pat, the 12 qualities of character we're talking about today, and, and guys, you'll, you'll hear Pat unpack this, uh, are compassion, courage, dedication, determination, dignity, discipline, integrity, loyalty, perseverance, responsibility, service, and trust. Powerful, powerful words. So let's dive in and talk about compassion, Pat. Unpack what true compassion looks like. Well, I think leaders are often noted as hard-nosed grinders, uh, get up in people's face, holler at them, Uh, but that doesn't fly anymore. And uh, and a true leader does have compassion for his people or her people, Uh, cares about them as individuals, Uh, wants to know about what what makes them tick. Uh, Mm -hmm. And the the person we used in this chapter, people might find kind of... uh, uh, amazing is, is Ulysses S. Grant, uh, who went to West Point. Uh, he's known as Butcher Grant, you know, who ground down the, the Southern forces, you know, at the end of the Civil War to, to win the war. But Grant had a great compassion for his soldiers. He cared about them. He was interested in them. He had a heart for them. He also had a great compassion for animals, particularly horses. He was a great horseman at West Point and, and was very comfortable on, on a horse. 
And and one time during the Civil War, he found a soldier who was whipping and beating his horse in an angry mm-hmm. fashion. And, and Grant stopped and got off his, his horse, went right after that soldier, told him that if he ever saw that again, uh, that soldier was going to be severely punished. Uh, he, he didn't want anything done to those horses that would be out of line. So, mm-hmm. so uh, that's how we opened the book. And I think uh, people are going to read that and say, well, maybe we should keep going here. This is interesting. Absolutely. And, and compassion in some people's mind, Pat, connotes being soft or weak, but that's not true at all, correct? Oh, I don't think so. I think great, great leaders have people skills. Uh, I yeah. think great leaders have a heart for people. They care about people. Uh, they have empathy for people. I, I think what we're really saying here is uh, great people, great leaders love people and uh, they're not afraid to show it. Right. Uh, They get involved with their people and they know people not just for what they can do for them in business or sports or any field, uh, but they want them to do well in life. Uh, They want them to do well long after uh, they have had their time with that particular person. And uh, that's that's a great uh, component. You know, when these uh, West Point grads Mm. of 1935 sat down and I'd love to have been in that meeting, by the way when they came up with these 12 words, that would have been fascinating uh, to see how many words they initially had up on the blackboard uh, and how, how they worked through the process to come up with these 12 words. That would have been very, very interesting. So true. Yeah, that's so true, Pat. Hey, you tell an interesting story about Steve Jobs in the book. A prominent figure, obviously, a founder of Apple. Uh, would you share that example with us as it relates to compassion? I, I think there's something in there people might not expect to hear. Well, Steve Jobs, you know, for all of his successes, uh, he was a hard man to work for. Uh, he was tough on his people. Uh, he could embarrass them. He could really humiliate his people. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was not an easy man to work for. He he had enormous success, and he had a brilliant mind, and he, he, he created a lot of things that have changed the way the world works. But uh, you can talk to many people uh, from Apple way back, and they would talk to you and say, oh, boy, you know, we respected him, and we thought he was a genius, but, mm. but uh, he could really, really get on us and embarrass us and make us feel foolish. And uh, I would say, Steve, you didn't need to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I don't know where that really advanced your cause. Um, that, that doesn't work today in any field. Now, maybe way back, you know, back in the dark ages, that's the way you led. But not today. And mm-hmm. any coach, for example, in my profession who tries to coach that way by humiliation and embarrassing players and, uh, you know, make, uh, throwing them out there as examples or uh, ripping them in the press. Mm. Oh, that coach is going to have a short shelf life, in my opinion. Because of the lack of compassion. Oh, I think so. Yeah. I, I, I think that today, I, I, in the sports world, I know this for a fact, that you've got to uh, take your time with people. Uh, Yes, coaches get frustrated and they want to see maybe better results. But if you start, uh, you know, ripping your players or chewing on them or embarrassing them in front of their peers or uh, 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 criticizing them publicly Mm. in a press conference, oh, that's 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 not going to fly. Not going to fly. Maybe you could do it at one time, but not now. And any coach who does not realize that is going to have a pretty short coaching career. Indeed, yeah. Well, let's move on to courage. Talk about courage, Pat. Well, it takes courage to be a great leader. And, and, and Chris, I do want to uh, continue to point out, this is a leadership book. When you get it right is. down to it, uh, everything at West Point, everything at West Point is preparing leaders. Mm-hmm. Same, at, same at Annapolis, same at the Air Force Academy, same at the Coast Guard Academy. But at, when you're at West Point, Uh, Everywhere you turn, everywhere you look, it's leadership, leadership, leadership. And uh, that's what these benches represent. Uh, To be a a leader is not easy. It takes courage. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I like to call it boldness. Uh, great leaders have a certain amount of boldness. They're, they're not afraid to make decisions. Uh, they're not afraid to make the tough call. Mm -hmm. uh, George W. Bush used to say in the White House, I'm the decider. I decide what to do. Well, every organization needs a decider. And, and if you don't have a strong decider, well, nothing's going to happen. Organizations just stagnate. Uh, they don't make any progress. Indeed. And um, so it, it's awfully important for anybody who wants to lead to have courage in their heart, courage in their soul, and above all, uh, not be afraid to make tough calls, to make decisions that matter. Um, and that's where organizations and teams and churches, I don't care who it is, when, when you've got a tough decider making strong decisions, uh, that's an organization that's really going to make headway. There's, there are a couple of stories here that I do want to just share with you right off the, you know, and, and, and weave them in here. One is uh, General Matthew Ridgway. We use him as an example uh, in, uh, at the start of D-Day uh, in, in uh, June of 1944. Uh, there's General Matthew Ridgway parachuting in with his soldiers on D-Day behind enemy lines, uh, right into the right into the fray. Uh, General Ridgway was not back in London. Uh, he was not out on a ship somewhere in the English Channel. Uh, he went right in as a parachute guy. You know, he was a general who, and that was his specialty. Um, boy, that, 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 that excites me. Of course, he went on and was the, was the general who ultimately uh, got the Korean War resolved to a point. But that story about him uh, jumping out of airplane, an airplane with his men uh, right there on D-Day, boy, that, uh, that really uh, gets me going. And then Mike Krzyzewski, the Duke basketball coach, he's a West Point graduate. He wrote the foreword to this book. And we talked about Coach K in the area of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And Coach K tells the story. He was a freshman at, at, at Army. He was a plebe. It's a, it's a sluggish, cold, miserable day. He's got his shoes beautifully shined, and an upperclassman, may have been his roommate, stepped in a puddle of gook, splashed it all over his shoes. And right at that point, Coach K had to make a decision. Do I go back to my room and get this fixed, or do I take my chances? Mm -hmm. Well, a, a, an officer stopped him and challenged him. And Coach K tried to alibi his way out. I was just walking across the campus in a upper class, but no, and the uh, officer challenged him. Reminded Mike that at West Point, when, when stopped by authority, uh, you have one of three responses. Yes, sir. No, sir. No excuse, sir. And uh, Coach K said, that was a turning point in my life. I learned that uh, responsibility is a huge part of leadership. Mm. His attitude became, this was done well and I did it. This was done poorly and I did it. But at either extreme, he said, I am responsible. Mm -hmm. and, and Mike, who is now, gosh, he's pushing 80. He's been coaching for decades. He said that incident was a real turning point in my life as a young leader. Mm. Pat, running through both of those stories and what I want everyone joined in this conversation to get a hold of is one word, and it's courage. I think in life we have to have the courage to do the right thing for the right reason. So powerful. Pat, up next is discipline. Talk about discipline. Why do we need more of it in life, and what does it do for our ability to stay focused and, and do the things that matter most for the people that matter most? Well, let's put it this way, Chris. We, when we're, when we're children, uh, the discipline is all done for us. Our parents provide the discipline. Here are the rules. Here's how we're going to run this house. Uh, here, here's how you fit in. Here's what you, you have to do. And uh, if you don't do it, here's the discipline that will be applied. But then when we leave the house at 18, we, we have to provide the discipline for ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
there's nobody there overseeing us every day to do it for us. And that is called self-discipline. And if a young person out there in the world uh, cannot discipline themselves, trouble lies ahead. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Pat. And as we're moving further into this, I think the next quality of character that I want to talk about is so pivotal in the in the point of discussion right now, and that's dedication. And one of my favorite statements uh, from the chapter on dedication, Pat, is when you wrote this, live each day dedicated to being mentored and mentoring others. Recognize the power of influential relationships in your life. Talk about dedication. What's the result of doing that, Pat? Well, I'm glad you brought up that topic, Chris. Uh, that reference to mentoring. We all need mentors in our life. Now, now you don't have to call them mentors. You can call them friends or you can call them life coaches. But we need people in our life who have been down the road of life, who who, who are able to see farther down the road than we could even imagine, uh, who know what life is about. They, they've got a wonderful qu- uh, quality, Chris, called wisdom. Uh, wisdom comes from living, and going through experiences and understanding what life is all about. Wise are the young people who seek out these veterans. It could be parents. It could sure be grandparents. It can be uh, teachers. It can be coaches, pastors, youth workers. Mm-hmm. Um, might be um, older students, let's say. But... Um, But for young people who think they have all the answers, can do everything their way, oh, they're going to run into trouble. Mm -hmm. They're going to run into roadblocks their whole life. They're going to start down paths repeatedly, and they're going to run into dead ends uh, because they didn't seek counsel and get advice from wise people who would have said, that's not a good path to take. Uh, let me let me recommend this path," he said. I, "I I see much better results here, and young people who disregard that, eh, they're going to end up with frustrating lives. Uh, we we don't have enough years on this earth, Chris, to make all the mistakes that that uh, that that you can make, and and so you've got to have those people in your life. And you know, Chris, I've learned you you never age out of needing mentors. That's so true. You never get to a point where you say, I'm 85 years old and I, I don't need any mentors anymore. Listen, I'm pushing 80 mm. in a year, a little over a year, and I've got mentors of all different stripes. Yeah. I, I, I go to them frequently, you know, seeking counsel or seeking advice. And uh, I, I, I would be very, very limited if I didn't have them in my life. So uh, a, a dedication is important to be dedicated to a cause or a team or um, a university or your business. It's important, dedicated to people, but uh, it sure helps to have those people around you uh, who can uh, make life a lot more simple for you and a lot more direct and thus a lot more uh, successful. Hmm. Yeah, indeed. Hey, Pat, I'm really in admiration of you because as you had just said you're nearing 80 years old yet you're still pursuing the ability to be taught you have a teachable spirit and and i think what fuels that is your determination pat and that's what i want to go to next is talking about determination i mean what does determination look like in everyday life take us back i love this story from the book take us back to the interaction you had with general norman schwarzkopf as it related to his determination to grow as a public speaker. That was a powerful example. Well, uh, we got to know Norman Schwarzkopf. He lived over in Tampa. So one one time uh, we had, uh, and he's featured in this book, one time we uh, had him over here for one of our fundraising events, and they put me in charge of, uh, of looking after him. Well, it was a real treat. It was a real privilege. Uh, and I, I had mm. a chance to chat with him uh, about a number of topics. I, I, one of the things I asked him was, uh, General, did it ever occur to you if, if that madman in the Middle East, um, you know, in Iraq, uh, Saddam, I said, if he hadn't acted out and gone crazy, did it ever occur to you that nobody ever would have heard of you? Well, he laughed and he said, I've thought about that many times. 
many times. He said, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, uh, made me a lot of money. Ah, meaning that the General Schwarzkopf became one of the country's most requested public speakers. Mm. And, and he wrote a number of books that were bestsellers, all because of Saddam Hussein. We chuckled over that. But, and then I asked him about public speaking because uh, he, he was out there and he was regarded as one of the top speakers in the country. And I said, what was the key? And he said, coming out from behind the lectern. He said, the minute I got out from behind the lectern and came out with nothing in front of me like that and, and could address an or, a, a crowd mm. with nothing between me and the audience, he said, that's when my speaking really went to another level. Well, Powerful. that was an important moment for me because uh, I was doing a lot of speaking at the time, and I had a tendency to, to, to hunker down behind that lectern, uh, you know, kind of as a comfort zone. And I, 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 after that, I said, I'm going to start trying that as well. And I've, ever since I've been doing that, and it made a huge difference in my speaking. It can become very scary initially when, when you're standing there and there's nothing in front of you to lean on or to put notes on. But uh, once General Schwarzkopf explained that, what he was doing, I said, all right, I'm going to give it a whirl as well. And that was many years ago, and I've been doing that ever since. Wow. Oh, Pat, indecision and fear and uncertainty threaten all of us. And this plays right into determination, perhaps even with the example you gave about General Schwarzkopf. How does determination fight against uncertainty and indecision and fear? Well, Chris, the best way I could explain that is uh, determined people are the ones who get ahead. That's determined good. people, determined people have goals in their life, and and they uh, keep those goals in front of them, and they strive to reach those goals. Uh, they don't let setbacks, um, you know, weigh them down. Mm -hmm. They learn from them, but they keep trucking, and mm -hmm. and they have an uh, intense desire uh, to achieve their goals, and they realize that in the middle of the of the push, you can't quit. You've got to stay with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can learn from your setbacks and disappointments and heartaches, but uh, determination means that your heart is into it. Mm -hmm. uh, your neck is bowed, as they say in baseball. Or, or they say, bow your neck. That's a baseball term. That means be determined. Mm -hmm. uh, stay, stay, stay strong. Don't, uh, don't wilt. Uh, don't fade. Uh, don't surrender. I think that's what we're trying to say, Chris. Hmm. That's so powerful. What I love about this book, Pat, is each one of these principles, each one of these chapters builds upon the next because our culture, Pat, has been so tainted by disrespect for others and for ourselves. Everyone has an opinion about everyone and everything, and they feel the need to share it. So where does dignity come into play? Well, I think, Chris, that means treating people well. Yes. Uh, we, we've talked about that a little bit. I think it means that uh, ev every human being needs to be treated with dignity, with respect, with care, wh whether it's the CEO or the lady who cleans the office at night. Uh, they all de deserve to be treated as, uh, as a human being, as equals. And, and wise are the leaders who do that. Mm -hmm. uh, th they'll be long remembered. And uh, it's important, uh, you know, and I tell executives is it's important to know the names of the people who, who clean up the office at night uh, they have names uh, they have they have real lives and uh, we need to go out of our way to treat them as the most important people in the building it's true because chris they probably are yeah they probably are uh, they 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 do a job that without it any company is going to be a mess mm -hmm. and and they deserve uh, as leaders, they deserve to be treated that way. Dignity. I, I always got the feeling, and we write about uh, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Yes. Uh, I always got the feeling that he uh, he treated people that way, treated his soldiers that way. Uh, he, he was interested in them. And, uh, he, you know, the great story when the decision was made to, to uh, launch D-Day on June 6, 1944, the decision was made. Eisenhower immediately went down uh, to the edge of England, you know, because he knew that these troops were heading out soon, and, and many of them were not going to live. But there was Ike down among them, 
there's that wonderful picture with soldiers gathered around him, uh, talking to him. And Eisenhower later said, I went down there to cheer those guys up. He said, they ended up cheering me up by saying, don't worry, General, we're going to get them. We'll get this done for you, General. Hmm. He, he said, they encouraged me more than uh, I, I possibly could them. Uh, I, I think that's an example of treating people with dignity. And I think what undergirded President Eisenhower, and I I love that you just went there with him. I I love history. I love politics. And I've always admired uh, President Eisenhower. I think what embodied him most, and you write about this in the book, of course, Pat, is uh, is his integrity. Talk about integrity in the president, because integrity is something we can't live without if we're gonna if we're gonna wake up and and live a life of influence. Chris, integrity comes. Uh, from the root word integer, which means one, uh, that would lead to a word like um, integrated, for example. An integrated society is, uh, well, it's it's one society. Uh, a leader of integrity, well, they're walk and talk match. They're not talking one way and walking in completely an opposite direction. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a consistency to their life. Uh, Eisenhower talked constantly about the importance of integrity. And we tell this story uh, way back in the Philippines. Uh, the Philippine government was uh, handing out a lot of money to the different general, American generals over there. Uh, I think MacArthur was ready to report it, got up to $500,000. Other uh, generals were offered uh, those, not those kind of monies, but some. Uh, Eisenhower was too, but uh, he turned it down. Uh, he, he declined. He said, I'm already getting paid for my work. And, and he, uh, he did not accept. Hmm. Um, I think his integrity was such that uh, he couldn't live, with, couldn't live that way. He, um, he, he couldn't uh, accept that kind of money knowing it wasn't illegal, but knowing also that it wasn't the right thing to do. Yeah, I, I think a person of integrity knows the difference between right and wrong, and 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 when uh, when when it's proper uh, to uh, to decline, C mm. I can't participate in that. Um, uh, without integrity, it's awfully tough to be a good leader, Chris. Wow, that's strong. Without integrity, it's tough to be a good leader. Pat, I'd love to know then, pull the curtain back. If we're talking about integrity, how, as you help lead the Orlando Magic, I, I love the organization. I, I loved watching Penny Hardaway and Shaq as I was growing up. And of course, as I had told you offline, my family lives in Winter Park. And so the Magic have always kind of uh, been in my heart outside the Pistons here up in Detroit. But um, where, where does integrity play a role in how you lead the Magic? What what happens at the core level of your leadership within the team, the coaching staff, the players? I, I, Chris, I probably learned the importance of that very early in my NBA career uh, because you're on the phone a lot talking to other teams about potential trades or personnel moves. Yes. And it's awfully easy. Uh, it's awfully easy as you're talking um, about players particularly to kind of shade the truth, uh, that this player may have a, a, an injury of sorts, but you want to dump that player and make this trade, and so you don't really lay out all the facts to, to your counterpart on another team. In other words, uh, and after a while, you get a reputation around the league, and it's a small business it's small but you get a reputation of being um be careful in dealing with him mm -hmm. uh, you may not get the straight shot from him you know he may shade the truth a little bit be careful and there were some people in in the profession who had that kind of reputation mm. you know, that you had to be careful in dealing with them yeah. because you weren't sure you know if you ask questions like what's his health like uh, anything else we need to know about him you know if we're going to make this trade just fill me in about him mm -hmm. and, and i'll fill you in on our guy uh, but if you aren't 
giving all the facts. If you're holding back, uh, you're soon going to be seen. You're soon going to be caught. Hmm. And, and, and you're not going to last long in the profession if, if you can't be viewed as a person of integrity, a person of honor. Hmm. That's when I first learned about it, Chris. Uh, very, very early in my NBA career as a GM. And, and I always went out of the way in any deals to make sure that I was uh, providing straight information. I, I didn't, I'd rather have the deal go south than yes. have to compromise my integrity. And that takes strong character, especially in a day where um, the zeros on dollar signs are abundant and there's a lot at stake. So that's that's powerful, Pat. I mean, what I hear you saying through that is, um, and this is the next character quality I want to talk about, you're loyal to what is right. You're loyal to not only people, but you're loyal to your own sense of integrity. In fact, you wrote in the book, uh, just pulled this quote, loyalty is based upon commitment, not feelings. That's a strong statement, Pat. Unpack that for us. Well, loyalty, I think really is, is a progressive word. Uh, I think the first word in this progression, Chris, is respect. And when there's respect in an organization, well, that's strong. And and when you have respect, that leads to trust, uh, which, which which sees guys put on a bench, you know, later on. But trust is a powerful bond when you can absolutely trust each other totally and don't have to worry about any misrepresentation. So respect mm-hmm. leads to trust, which leads to loyalty. And, and loyalty means I'm with you. Yes. I'm not going to I'm not going to fade out on you. Uh, I'm not going to. um pack it in halfway down the trail, hmm. uh, you can count on me. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm with you all the way, uh, up and down, rain or shine, mm-hmm. win or lose, you know, you, you, I'm with you. Loyalty then, uh, by the way, uh, leads to love. So yeah. if you have a respect in, a, in an organization, which leads to trust, which leads to loyalty, which leads to love, uh, unconditional love among people on on any team, Chris, that's strong, really strong. Yes. But there's one more step, and that's called friendship. Now, that's the ultimate. When any organization, you know, has a bond of friendship, uh, it doesn't get any deeper than that. So those are the five steps that I would just offer to you, uh, you know, any progressive steps in any organization. Respect, to trust, to loyalty, to love, to friendship. Uh, that, that, that's the way it works. That's so powerful. Well, Pat, perseverance, the next character quality is so close to my heart. To me, it's never giving up in the face of adversity. And this one really hits home, uh, Pat, because my mom battled multiple myeloma for over 18 years before it took her life six years ago. Uh, really? she never, she never gave up. And Pat, listen, the reason I mentioned that is because you never gave up either, Pat. And I just want to honor you right now. Um, I get choked up thinking about it um, for being such a great example of perseverance to me. I, I've been I've been following you for years, um, and it, I admire you, Pat. Uh, when my mom was still alive, um, she knew who you were, and and she was mm-hmm. so um, captivated by your perseverance as a leader, Pat. So I just want to say thank you for never giving up. But when my mom was battling cancer, she always focused on what she could do despite what she couldn't do. And to me, that's perseverance, Pat. That's you. That's you, Pat. Well, Chris, thank you for sharing that story about your mother. Uh, I'd like to have met her. I'm in the ninth year. I was diagnosed uh, over eight years ago now with multiple myeloma, which they tell me is a pretty rare form of of cancer. Yes. Uh, Although it seems I'm hearing about more and more people who have have dealt or are dealing with it. Uh, The doctor's Uh, have told me that I'm doing well, I feel good, and I'm able to keep my full schedule. Um, But I have learned with this this form of cancer, Chris, uh, to go on living your life. Uh, Don't sit on the sideline. Uh, Don't surrender. Uh, Do everything that you would be doing normally, even if you have to do it a little bit differently or a little slower, uh, but keep doing it. And uh, so in writing books and speaking and helping run a basketball team and uh, my family situation and so forth, I I just keep plugging. You can't quit. It's a league rule, Chris. That's kind of what I think I'm saying here. 
Mm. And uh, it's easy to toss it in. But Chris, here's what I've learned. Everybody's got some issues in their life. Yep. Everybody has some physical issues or mental issues or family stuff going on. We, we all have different problems. Yes. Uh, I just, mine happens to be multiple myeloma, but uh, we all, none, none of us get through life unscathed. So I, I, I encourage people, keep trucking, That's uh, right. keep, keep, keep doing what you do well, mm -hmm. uh, um, keep a smile on your face, don't surrender. Um, it, it's important to be a, you know, a dogged guy, a dogged woman, you know, you're just going to keep going. Yes, and you're sir. going to do it with a smile on your face, and that you're going to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. well, that, that's uh, that's a big deal. Hmm. Wow. Well, Pat, earlier, I know you uh, you shared the story about Coach K, and again, um, another hero in my life, and I, I, I love his career. And I actually didn't know he went to West Point until reading your book, and it goes back to responsibility. I think I don't want to gloss over that as we're, as we're landing the plane in conversation today. Uh, Pat, what else can we know, should we know about, about responsibility? And taking responsibility for our own lives is not, not living as victims. Chris, we're living in an age, I think, of deflected responsibility. Uh, we see a lot of leaders who uh, make decisions. If they work out, oh, we hear about it. Oh, yes. If, they, if it doesn't work out, uh, we don't hear so much. And, uh, but I like leaders who step up and say, you know, I'm responsible for this. Mm -hmm. It didn't work, but... I'm, you know, I'm not pointing fingers. Mm -hmm. I'm not blaming others. I'm, I'm not going to, uh, you know, try and duck out of this. That's important in any role of life. Yes. Uh, to be responsible. I want to write a book about it someday. I think I think it's that important. You should. So, uh, so I, I think uh, particularly we need to teach our young people uh, that particular quality. Mm -hmm. That if you will take responsibility for what you've done here, and every decision you make, kiddo, has an outcome. Mm -hmm. and, and you've got to think very carefully before you make any decision, because that decision is, has an outcome, and you have got to be responsible for the outcome. And, and if it doesn't work, or if it's a bad decision, and, and the outcome is terrible, well, you've got to own up to it. Yeah. Uh, you can't start alibi and blaming others and trying to run away from it. We, we need that to get that across to, to kids. And, uh, uh, you know, make sure they understand that before you make any decision, to be very, very careful in your thinking about what's going to happen as a result of your decision because uh, you uh, you got to take responsibility here. There's nobody else who, who made that decision for you. I think I think that's what we're trying to get across, Chris. Sure, makes me think of um, I believe it's it's an old Zig Ziglar quote, but and I think one of the things that keeps people from taking responsibility, even as I survey culture today, Pat, is uh, it's the quote he said: "Failure is an event, not a person." And we take on the shame of failure, and then because shame hurts, fear hurts, uh, defeat hurts, then we deflect responsibility. Do you think that's an accurate assessment that I just made there, Pat? Oh, I think very much so, very much mm -hmm. so. And uh, uh, well, one of uh, one of my favorite authors, a fellow named Andy Stanley, pastors a oh, church yeah. in the in the Atlanta area. Uh, he wrote a book uh, a few years back called "The Best Question Ever." And, and in the book, he says, before you make any decision, ask yourself this, the best question ever. Based on my past experiences and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? Yeah. And he says, that's the best question ever. And if you'll ask that question before any decision you make, he said, think of all the heartache you're going to avoid and think of all the stress that'll be removed from your life just ask that simple question what's the wise thing to do here mm -hmm. and uh th that's a good way to teach i think that's a good point to get across to young people that's really good but how do we develop greater trust in relationships all relationships professional and personal 
Well, Chris, towards the end of the book, and we've talked, I've talked about trust, sure. you know, in that progression. Uh, but there's another word on one of those benches. It's called service. And I think what those uh, graduates or that class was trying to get across to these young people at, at school was uh, it's not about you guys and gals. It's not about you. It's about others. And, and you are to serve them as a leader. You're to serve them and not be served by people. You're there to serve. It's called serving leadership. It's called servant leadership. And a serving hearted leader is always thinking that way. It's not about me. It's about you. It's not about uh, my career. It's about your career. It's not about my personal success, but it's about your success and the success of this organization. It's not advancing and building my resume, trying to promote myself, but see that this organization succeeds and people succeed and live up to their full potential. That, mm -hmm. That's the mindset of a, of a man or a woman who believes in service as a leader and has a serving hearted mentality. I think that's what it's all about. And I'm so glad that that class of 1935 included that word. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased about that. Now, Chris, here, here's a good discussion point for any group. When you study those 12 words, were there any words perhaps that should be included if they, if they had put in a 13th or 14th or 15th bench? Hmm. There's a good discussion point. Sure. I'll I'll leave that I'll leave that to our listeners. Indeed, uh, that they can they can have a good time kicking that one around. Mm. Pat, which one of these twelve has been the most difficult for you to employ in your own life? Oh, that's it. That's a good question. Um, you know, it's it's. Uh, I I guess uh, we all struggle with discipline. Uh, the discipline to turn that extra dessert down. The the discipline to go to bed at night at a reasonable hour, mm -hmm. the discipline to get up in the morning, uh, the discipline to say no when everybody's saying yes, that, that probably is, uh, you're, you're, you never conquer that whole area of, of self-discipline. It, it's in front of you every day. So I would say, Chris, probably that's, that's the one that I struggle with the most. Wow. Thanks for that transparency, Pat. As we're, uh, as we're closing our time together, Pat, I'd just love to leave the floor with you just to speak directly to everyone joining the conversation with us today. Perhaps you could encourage them or even just give them some, um, some action items to, to take from this conversation and then apply to their lives. Well, Chris, let me just uh, review again that overlooking the Hudson River on the campus of the United States Military Academy at West Point are 12 granite benches. And each one is inscribed with a word representing a key leadership virtue. We can all grow and we can all develop. We can advance as leaders, every one of us. And these benches remind cadets of the qualities that lead to victory and success, not just on the battlefield where some of these young men and women will be, but in all of life as well. Mm. So those benches were left there uh, to really inspire the young cadet men and women, but uh, we have now written this book to inspire others as well and let those benches no longer be the best kept secret in military history, but uh, to be open and available to all of us so that we can advance and improve as leaders. Powerful. Friends, he is Pat Williams. He's the senior vice president of the Orlando Magic. Just a a phenomenal leader in his own right. He's the author of the brand new book, Character Carved in Stone. Again, we've been talking about the 12 principles from this book today. Go get the book. I believe it'll change your life as it has mine. Pat, thank you again for uh, for joining me today. Honestly, I've admired you from afar since I was a little boy. So this is, uh, this is a treat of a lifetime. And to know that you <laughs> knew my Uncle Carmen Morrow, it's unbelievable. So thanks for being here today. Chris, my pleasure. Uh, really nice to visit with you, and I hope people enjoy the book. Oh, indeed. Pat, thanks again. Treat of a lifetime. All the best, Chris. Take care now. 
My friends, listen, to be a successful leader, you have to be a person of character. And as I said at the top of the show, I really believe that character is doing the right thing even when no one else is watching. So really grateful to Pat for that conversation. I just want to take a moment to uh, to recap some of the key statements he made, and I'm going to give you guys an application point for this week. First thing he said is that you never grow too old to have a mentor. Here's Pat. He's nearing 80 years old, and because he has a teachable spirit, he still is inviting people to speak into his life, to teach him, Uh, Because in life, you all know that we don't know what we don't know. And I always say to people, because we don't know what we don't know, we always have an opportunity to grow. Second thing Pat said is that determined people are the ones who get ahead. Determined to never give up, even in the face of pain and loss and crisis, when it comes, not if it comes. Again, determined people are the ones who get ahead. I love this statement. He said, loyalty is based upon commitment not feelings. How many of you guys wake up and go, yep, I don't feel like doing what I said I was going to do. I don't feel like uh, following through on, on the commitment I made. Well, loyalty is based on your word, your commitment, not your feelings. To that, he said, respect leads to trust and trust leads to loyalty. Then, of course, I believe the most challenging statement Pat made in the conversation was this. He said, we're living in an age where too many leaders deflect responsibility. So my challenge to you guys this week is to be the leader who accepts responsibility for the choices and for the decisions you make, even if it results in failure. Because listen, as I said, failure is an event, not a person. Good leaders take responsibility. Yep. I tried my best. I thought this was going to be the best decision, but it didn't work. And you know what? I'm going to learn from this. I take responsibility for it. I believe that's how we become good leaders, guys. Well, listen, this week's application point, aside from that, is I want you to pick one of the 12 virtues we talked about today. Again, the 12 are compassion, courage, dedication, determination, dignity, discipline, integrity, loyalty, perseverance, responsibility, service, and trust. Now, here's the deal. You can't do this alone. I want you to pick up the phone, call a friend, text a friend, ask a coworker, ask your spouse to provide some feedback for you in that one area. Ask them, how am I doing in this area? Listen to their honest feedback. And then, as hard as it may be, take what resonates with you and apply it to your life. This week, just pick one of them. And apply it to your life so that you can grow to become the best you're capable of becoming. To become a leader that others want to follow. Period. Well, listen, next week on the show, you don't want to miss it. Another leadership lesson is coming right at you because I have the FBI's former lead hostage negotiator, Chris Voss, joining me to talk all about negotiation and the power of it in your relationships. Don't miss it. Here's a little preview. Well, you know, it's kind of crazy. In every deal... Um there's something the other side wants more actually than an agreement. You know, we believe the world splits up evenly into thirds, which is fight, flight, and make friends. And two out of three of those types just want to be understood. And that's all they want. I mean, uh, I think all of us can think of a boss that we worked for at one point in time when, you know, the boss may have not have done what we wanted him to, but the, the boss always hurt us out. Mm. And we loved following, working for, working with people who hurt us out, just hurt us out, not agreed, you know, just hurt us out. And that that's kind of how we end up at loggerheads in most conversations, because you get two people driving really hard to be hurt out, mm-hmm. then they get even more frustrated as the process goes forward. That's next week right here on the show. Don't miss it. And coming up on Win Today... Levi Lusco, Erwin McManus, John Bevere, and former Olympian and American record holder Ryan Hall. I cannot wait to share these conversations with you because my desire for you, my friend, is to help you design your roadmap to wholeness, which is body, mind, and spirit from the inside out. Hey, before I let you go, go to the Apple Podcast app or iTunes and leave me a rating and review. I promise it takes less than 30 seconds and helps me help other people just like you design their roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. Until next week, visit me over at wintoday.tv for blog posts and archive podcasts, of course, all aimed at helping you, my friend, design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. Can't wait to talk to you next week with the FBI's former lead hostage negotiator, Chris Voss. You're going to want to buckle up for that one. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.